We'll go ahead and get started. Well, I want to start by welcoming everyone and saying good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Tim Carlberg, and I'm a principal from the Skoll Foundation. I'm thrilled to introduce this discussion today in a session as part of the Skoll World Forum entitled Learning Without Schools, Education, Relief, and Government Partnership During the COVID-19 Outbreak. Today, we will hear about how two large school systems in Pakistan and West Africa are shifting to partner with governments and other civil society actors to educate children at home without internet access. These are case studies on how local leaders address the challenges of providing education and relief in partnership with government during this global crisis. One of the organizations represented is the Citizens Foundation, which has been called the world's largest independently operated network of schools. TCF runs over 1600 schools in Pakistan today for out of school children. They hire only women as faculty and are funded almost entirely by local philanthropy. In the home country of Malala, half of their student body is girls. Rising Academies, is one of the fastest growing school networks in Africa, working in more than 160 schools and serving 50,000 students. Rising Academies was founded in Sierra Leone in 2014. During the Ebola epidemic, Rising provided homeschooling to children kept out of school by the crisis. They are currently partnering with governments and other partners to deliver curriculum via radio and SMS in West Africa and beyond. Our, our moderator today is Dr. Shashi Bulaswar. He's the founder and CEO of the Institute for Transformative Technologies. ITT brings to life breakthrough technology, technologies for combating global poverty through advanced research, user-centric product engineering and a unique commercialization model with private companies in emerging markets. Before I hand over to Shashi, I want to note just a few logistical items. Um, we are recording this session today and it will be published online shortly after we wrap up our discussion. We want this to be very conversational, so I encourage you all to submit questions using the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. We'll integrate your questions into the panel discussions when you submit your questions. Please share your name and where you're, where you're sending your question from. And then I'll, I'll come into the discussion every so often to bring questions in. Finally, um, please feel free to share this session um, widely with others who you might find it interest, who might find it interesting or informative for their work. And without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Shashi Bulaswar to kick things off for us. Thank you, Tim. Uh, welcome, everyone. So nothing like a, a global virtual conversation with the 250 of our closest friends. Um, uh, these are very challenging times and one of the, you know, as, as difficult as things are, uh, one of the more heartwarming things is how everyone is putting their shoulder to the wheel. We'll, we'll hear some really amazing stories about how the panelists and their organizations and colleagues are trying to address this problem. Um, let me, uh, you know, and it's really interesting, the, the choice of organizations here is very interesting. Um, uh, TCF, as Tim said, is one of the largest private school networks in the world. Uh, Pakistan is actually considered one of the countries that's most likely to get really hit hard by COVID. Um, and uh, and in, before that, as, as we know, with the Ebola crisis, West Africa was, was hit really bad. So with that in mind, there's a lot of experience that comes to the, to the table in terms of both education and how to deal with situations like this. Let me get started with, with, uh, with Mr. Mushtaq Chapra, who's the co-founder um, of TCF and a Skoll Awardee. He also is a co-founder of an organization called Patients Aid Foundation. Uh, Mushtaq Bhai, uh, can you tell us a little bit about TCF uh, and its history before we jump into, into specifically how you're dealing with COVID? Thank you, Shashi. Uh... I'm really honored and proud to be a panelist uh, here today. Um, Citizens Foundation, um, as uh, you mentioned, is the largest uh, private managed uh, and run uh, schooling system in the world today. 
we uh, started off 25 years ago, six founders, and we had a, a crazy notion that we wanted to change Pakistan and then the world. And I hope that we are on the, on the right track. Uh, today, from five schools which started in 1996, today we have got 1,650 schools, 266,000 children, and uh, we are in more than 700 locations of Pakistan. We have a, a staff of more than 18,000 people. Out of these, 12,500 are women. We are proud to say that we are the largest employer of women in, in Pakistan. Um, TCF, uh, amongst other things, works very closely with communities in developing the, the mothers uh, by, by giving them basic literacy and uh, giving them uh, uh, an empowerment which, which is unheard of in this country. So, uh, and TCF has been in the forefront of uh, major calamities uh, like the earthquake and the floods uh, when, when they have hit Pakistan uh, because uh, we have such a large volunteer base with guest educated alumni who are always available uh, to help out. Great. We'll, we'll hear much more about TCF's amazing work. Um, Susanna Hare, Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development, calling in from London. Uh, Susanna, tell us a little bit about your work, and, 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 and we'll come back later on to get uh, from you a landscape of what uh, various school systems and various governments are doing to deal with, uh, the, deal with education in the COVID context. Uh, sure, thank you, Shashi, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Susanna Hares, and I'm a senior fellow and co-director of the education program at the Center for Global Development. And we're a think tank based in Washington, DC, um, and also in London. I'm very honored to be on this panel, not least because I'm a big fan of the Citizens Foundation and the Rising Academies. I've had the privilege of visiting their schools in Pakistan and in um, and in West Africa, and I'm consistently impressed with how both organizations so frequently put their own organizational incentives aside and really step up to help government in their, in their efforts. Um, so they're the ones doing the real and important work here. Um, I'm the one who writes policy papers and blog posts, um, and that's really my role in this discussion is to provide a bit of, I guess, broader evidence and, and context. Wonderful. Paul Skidmore, a CEO of Rising Academies Network, joining us from Accra. Uh, Paul, tell us about your organization a little bit, and, and um, again, we'll come back to the experience you had with Ebola and, and uh, how you're, you're using that to deal with COVID. Yeah, thank you, Shashi, and, and uh, hello again, everybody. Uh, so, Rising Academy is in normal circumstances as a network of schools in Sierra Leone and Liberia, uh, both uh, low-cost private and in partnership with government. Uh, but today, our 50,000 students have joined the more than 1 billion worldwide kept out of school by this crisis. And so we've been repurposing and redesigning our curriculum for delivery over the radio, building on what we learned during the Ebola crisis. And I'm excited to talk about that later in the conversation. Wonderful. And then uh, Riaz Kamlani, who is the executive VP of Outcomes for TCF. He's also leading their, uh, their COVID response, uh, joining us from Karachi. Riaz, welcome, and a uh, 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 quick highlight of the kinds of things you're doing. Yes, um, greetings everyone from around the world. Um, so I also, like Mushakla, work at TCF, and um, overall I'm responsible for the design of the program that we implement across a countrywide network, but currently I'm also leading TCF's COVID response, which is in the communities that we work through our alumni and through our teachers, how we can provide relief to those in most in need, and also working with government and other partners to ensure that children who are at at, not at schools now at homes, how can their continuity of, of, of education be uh, assured in such challenging circumstances? So look forward to talking more about it as we move forward in the discussion. Wonderful. So let's, let's now uh, uh, go back to Paul. Paul, you know, there are lots of, so, so, you know, the, the medical profession and the public health profession, when they think about COVID, the people point to SARS, people point to Zika, but from a, you know, how people are feeling on the ground point of view, you know, uh, Ebola must have been terror inducing, right? And, and so 
what was that like you know, and how did you deal with it and what are some of the lessons that can be applied to the COVID situation? Yeah, I think there is something both bewilderingly new and depressingly familiar about this epidemic for people in this part of the world. Um, and there's a bitter irony for us that the students whose start of secondary school was delayed six years ago by Ebola now find their end of secondary school delayed by this coronavirus. Uh, I think that the diseases are very different um, and uh, I, I'm not a health expert but it's clear that in terms of the kind of sheer lethality of the diseases Ebola was much more kind of terror inducing. Um, that said coronavirus is um, also a very, very serious disease. And I think one effect um, of having lived through Ebola is that from what we've seen communities, not just in the countries most directly affected by Ebola, Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea, but really across this region have been much quicker, I think, to respond to the threat of coronavirus, both at the kind of community level, but also at the government level. And that's important because, as we know, they are likely to be much worse um, affected in terms of the public health systems and the risk of overwhelm when that happens. I think in terms of how we um, learn and, and what we've sort of um, uh, taken from that experience, there's a couple of just quick points I'd make. The first is that the health and safety issues come first. We're not a health organization, but um, we uh, back then were able to play a role in educating communities about the symptoms of the disease, playing a role in certain preventative health aspects. And that's what we've tried to do again in the more than 160 school communities that we work with in terms of providing health and sanitation, in terms of providing health messaging. I think importantly for education organizations, we also need to remember that the risks that children will be exposed to now that they're out of school are not just about the disease. They're also about the risks that they may be exposed to as a result of not being in school um, and finding ways to get those um, preventative safeguarding measures across at a distance, I think is one of the key challenges that we need to kind of learn from. And then the second thing we learned is just around how to get a distance learning solution going as quickly as possible, because the health comes first. After that, I think we just have to try and keep kids anchored to the system as best as we can. And that means minimizing the gap between these schools closing and there being something in place for them to be engaging with on the educational side. Now, I am, I'm calling in from California and one of the unfortunate things that schools have to deal with here is active shooter drills, right? And so one of the depressing realities is that schools and kids are now having to start uh, uh, building templates really for, okay, what happens? And it sounds like Certainly after COVID, there's going to, you know, lots of school systems will, will, will have a template. Um, and I suspect that, that you will be at the forefront of that now that you'll have had experience with, with two of these things. Uh, let, me, let me turn to, uh, to Mushtaq and just walk us through what went through your mind, you know, running such a large network before you appointed uh, Riaz to, to lead the response. You know, just walk us through as somebody running such a large school system, what goes through your mind as you start hearing about things like shutdowns and, 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 and thinking about the needs of, of, of your students in particular, because it's not just any school system, but, but these are students who don't have access, for whom school is such a fundamentally defining uh, a, a part of life. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, uh, Shashi, that's a, that's a worry which has been uh, on our minds uh, right from, because uh, it's just been about uh, four weeks uh, since our schools have been shut down. The first uh, COVID case was uh, diagnosed in Pakistan in, in the beginning of uh, March. Uh, we see that uh, hustling, bustling schools turned into ghost schools, you know, they were children buildings and the, the desks and the, everything is as is without the kids there. Um, the immediate reaction, of course, was uh, for us to uh, make it of keeping or teaching them the social distancing. You see, it's not easy, like uh, uh, Paul uh, mentioned, that uh, we are in the poorest of the poor neighborhoods of Pakistan. People you find in, in a small uh, home, eight or nine 
people living together. But you know, the fortunate part is the TC, TCF uh, education system or the curriculum is, is based on critical thinking and making these kids aware of not only their, their, their uh, academics, but the, the environment and the, and, the, and the hygiene and the health part of life. So they are taking back goodness to their homes, you know, and uh, they are probably in generations, they are the only educated lot coming out of the schooling system. So this, this was a very big plus point. However, however, the financial issues in, in, uh, in these homes is, is, is so vast that, you know, they, they are living on a day-to-day -day basis. And due to these lockdown, TCF, TCF had to think about how to keep the, uh, the, the home running, how to keep the kitchen running, how to keep, because they, they don't have any livelihood, they don't have any saving. So, uh, and the first step which TCF took was that we immediately gave the uh, salaries, the full month salaries to the whole staff so that they, there is no uh, reason for them uh, to go without food on the table. Uh, and as we go along, I'm going to explain to you uh, how, how TCF uh, is, is uh, launching in a, a very major uh, uh, COVID uh, or coronavirus uh, appeal uh, to, the, to the, the TCF uh, donors within the country and overseas. So that uh, in the days or the weeks com coming, which will be the hard, hard times for these uh, very people, we would be able to sustain them for a, for a reasonable amount of time. Great, great. Susanna, let's uh, turn to you. What are you seeing? Uh, how, uh, what's, can, can you give us a landscape of how various education systems, public and private around the world and the, and the governments writ large are responding? Um, sure. So I can sort of firstly present a little bit of data that we've collected and secondly, just offer a couple of thoughts of, of my you. own. Um, so what do we know about school closures globally? Well, we at CGD have tracked school closure policies in more than 200 countries. Um, and we've made that available via an open access database, which um, anyone here can access. Um, thank you to my colleague Shelby Carvello and Lee Crawford who've, um, who've led that work. I'm just gonna hopefully share my screen and show you a couple of snapshots from that data. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, so firstly, what we can see is that schools in developing countries, especially in Africa, close their schools down quite early. So many actually close their school systems before any cases were reported, and most close their systems down after just a handful of cases were reported. Um, that might well be an effective way to reduce transmission, but it may also mean that schools are closed for, for quite a long time in those countries. Um, oh. And Susanna, before you go to the next slide, was there a history to this? You know, you know, what was the motivation for, I mean, we, we heard from Mushtaq that Pakistan also was very early in closing the school systems down. Now, uh, is there a policy framework that these governments are following? Um, I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I sort of, I hesitate to, to sort of stroll into those grounds. I think there's a lot of political economy considerations, I think, in these decisions. So I think when some countries close, others are more likely to follow suit. Um, and while we do have quite a bit of evidence on when to close schools down, perhaps in northern countries and for other diseases, for example, for, for influenza, we don't really have a huge amount of evidence around what the right thing to do is um, in the lower income countries and for, for this disease. So I think it's a very difficult decision for any education minister and indeed health minister to make um, and one that they won't have made lightly. Um, so just looking at this slide now, um, and thanks to my colleague Laura, who, who made this beautiful map, um, you can see that um, most countries in the Northern Hemisphere um, and in sort of South and Southeast Asia do have some kind of distance learning program running while their school systems are, are closed. Um, I should caveat that by saying these are the national distance learning programs that have been, been announced by the government. And they're the ones that we found sort of through hours of scouring ministry websites and ministry social media pages, but we may well have missed some and we may well have um, not included ones that are just being announced um, at the moment or in the last day or so. <clears throat> but even so, you can see there's a big gap on the African continent in terms of countries that 
that do have national distance learning programs in place for their school children. Um, and then thirdly, you can see that sort of the mode of delivery of government distance learning programs um, varies quite considerably among regions and correlates quite neatly with, with income level. Um, so most high income countries are delivering their online instruction, sorry, their distance learning programs online and most lower income countries are not relying on, on online education. Um, of course, not all children in high income countries like the UK and the US do have access to the internet. So there are some sort of quite important equity considerations there. Um, but I think it is quite important to note that governments in low income countries don't seem to be seeing too much potential in some of the sort of ed tech apps and online programs that are being promoted by, by various um, private tech companies at the moment. Um, and fourthly, I mean, I think there's good reason for that. Um, so not too many citizens in low income countries do have access to the internet. Um, if we want to be reaching kids in these countries, then it looks like that quality radio and quality TV content is probably the way to go for this crisis. Um, and I know we're going to hear sort of more about that from, from Rising Academies and Citizens Foundation in a moment. Um, so I guess I just had sort of three brief things to say, my own thoughts about, about that data. Um, I think firstly, you know, we don't really know too much about what works in terms of ed tech and distance learning. And I'm not especially optimistic that distance learning programs are going to be particularly effective at getting kids learning or keeping kids learning while schools are closed. Um, I mean, sadly, children don't learn very much when schools are open. Um, but I don't think that means that these programs are a waste of time, not by any means. And I absolutely think it's worth doing all we can to make these programs as good as we possibly can. And that's because, and this is my second point, that I think so the role of these programs, and Paul alluded to this, um, in terms of keeping kids connected to education could really be crucial. So sort of maintaining a link to their education while schools are closed for weeks or for months is really important if we want to reduce dropout rates and sort of communicate with children about the disease and about their safety while they're out of school. Um, I really hope that they learn something too, but even if they don't, I don't think that means we should declare distance learning programs as a failure. Um, and alongside that, I think I say this with no bias at all. I think it's really imperative that we do proper evaluation as much as we can during this crisis so that next time round, and sadly there will be a next time round, we know much more about what can work and we might even learn things that can be helpful when schools reopen again. Um, and my, my final point, um, you know, I think the education sector is, is rightly perhaps focusing on what children might learn during school closures. Um, but it seems that by far and away, the biggest and most serious impact on education in the wake of the COVID pandemic um, is not really going to be about lost learning. It's going to be about the, the economic crisis that we'll see. So, as a result of this, sort of families and governments and donors are all going to have much less money to spend on education. Um, and that's going to have some serious sort of consequences potentially for the most vulnerable children or for girls. And we should be thinking um, about that and planning for that um, right now. Great. Um, let's, let's turn to Paul with a, a couple of specific questions. But before we do that, just want to invite people to post questions. And then, uh, and then uh, Tim will jump in and introduce questions as, as, as we uh, go forward. So Paul, you know, um, Susanna painted a picture that's, you know, not, it, it's, it's tough, right? You know, a, we don't, you know, hopefully this is not going to be a recurring theme. But at the same time, we, you know, we are seeing, you know, uh, um, in, um, in increasing the density and the quality of the internet infrastructure and so on and so forth. That's not necessarily been the case in a lot of the places you're working in. And so how are, what's the day to day of distance learning for you? Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, that you have to figure out what the right technology is for your setting. As Susanna was saying, um, in Sierra Leone, upwards of 80% of people are listening to the radio um, in and probably 15% uh, or so are online or able to watch TV in their own home. So it's kind of a no brainer that um, radio plus um, sort of non-smartphone based technologies like SMS are the right kind of approach for our setting. And so what we're doing is taking our um, curriculum content, which we normally deliver through, um, you know, teachers in the classroom and redesigning it for delivery over radio. 
Um, we're part of the national response, um, along with partners like Educade in, in Sierra Leone and uh, partners like U Movement and Teach for Liberia in Liberia. But we also want to take that raw material, if you like, and make it as available as possible for other people in other settings. So the radio scripts themselves are putting online if people want to then take that and re-record it um, for their own um, setting and put it on radio there. Um, where that's an appropriate technology, then um, we'd be delighted for them to do that. So what's the day to day like? So just w walk us through a day in the life of a student. Do you try to maintain the same hours? How do you translate, you know, what is a conversation between the, in the classroom to SMS or, or a radio broadcast or something else? Yeah, so the radio um, our broadcast is, I guess, the key bit um, because that's the most ubiquitous technology. Um, it's, uh, you know, we, from our point of view, we want to get as much content on the airwaves as possible. Um, that means probably working with both national stations and um, local stations wherever possible. Um, obviously, we are trying to make um, content that's suitable for different age groups. That doesn't mean kind of one lesson for every single grade, but there's going to be a difference between what's appropriate for the early years versus lower primary versus uh, lower secondary and so on. So kind of grouping content into those bands. Um, that does mean that there are going to be limitations on how much we can put out there. For your average student, this is not going to be anywhere near as much material as they might get uh, in the context of a given day. But from our point of view, if the content can be really fun and engaging, which means trying to make it as, if you like, interactive as possible, making, you know, creating lesson um, scripts where there are opportunities for the kids to be practicing and kind of rehearsing the material in their homes, potentially with others around them, then that's a way for it to kind of be brought to life rather than just sitting and listening to uh, a kind of lecture. The SMS piece we see as more sort of supplemental. It's really about trying to make sure that additional content can be provided where that's possible, uh, about trying to kind of change certain behaviors. So making sure that parents are aware that this is happening and that they can be prompting the children to tune in that they can be following up with children and asking what they got out of the program, those sorts of nudges, as well as another way of getting some of these messages out about both the disease and about how they can be keeping their kids safe from other risks that they're facing. And so let's add some more questions. Sure. Yeah, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So we had a couple questions on this theme coming on to the Q&A. So folks, again, just the, the Q&A button down there at the bottom, if you want to ask questions, we're answering some in real time via text, and then we'll bring some into the discussion. So we had a, Kazimolo from Spark Schools in South Africa, who was asking about how to extend virtual uh, learning for families that still lack basic access to internet connectivity. So perhaps, Riaz, you could share with us how your organization is connecting with families that lack basic access to internet connectivity during this time of quarantine and lockdown. Riaz, you're in mute. Riaz, uh, you're on mute. Which is myself? Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you for that question. I think um, in terms of our response, firstly would like for us to retain some context. Um, this has been a very rapidly developing period, but the effective lockdown, the schools have been closed for three odd weeks and lockdown has been there for 10 days. 24th of March was when the lockdown began. So I think our response is, um, uh, evolving very rapidly. And uh, this is a space that will find shape and form in the weeks to come. Um, I think in terms of our response to this particular challenge, uh, you're absolutely right in that we are at TCF face as a practitioner with an environment where online access is not possible for almost all of our of, of all, almost all of TCF students. And that's a starting point. So with that starting point, we have gone into a conversation to say, what can we bring to the piece? Um, and I think that's where what you see in Pakistan is that a whole countrywide dialogue that is evolving of which TCF is a part. Um, so how that is shaping up is firstly that um, there are edtech providers, about 17 or 18 of them. All of them have gotten together, pulled together all of their material and so to speak, made it open source for any government, any organization that wants to use it. Um, and that's been a great development and that's been largely led by the federal government. Um, the other provincial governments have also followed suit and there is an evolution that is happening there. Um, the second bit has been that taking all of that content where uh, there's been just an MOU signed today, based on which there will be a national challenge, a national TV channel, which would be airing that content for about nine hours a day. 
structured almost as a classroom basis. So you will have, let's say, grade three English going on from 840 to 920, followed by grade four maths. Uh, so that's the mode that the national response is evolving into. Now, in that, what we believe we can bring, while this is very good work, and I think this is much needed, what we believe really matters here is a manner of engagement which retains children's interest. So I agree with what Susanna and Paul alluded to, that right now it is not that important to focus on what the student learning outcomes are, but focusing more on retaining students' interest so that the process of learning can continue. So how do you retain that interest? How do you manage that relationship, particularly in the early years, and particularly in a context where you may find a home-based classroom essentially in front of a television, which is a multi-age one, a multi-grade one. Um, so TCF's response that we are in the process of evolving and we should have something on that in a very concrete form by next week to be shared with the government so it can be aired, is an early childhood level program where essentially you bring in all of the thematic work that TCF has done at its, at its ECE level. Um, so we have done work on storybooks, on our teacher guides, on our books, which has been thematically structured around our community, our country, our body, colors, so and so forth. So we have a thematic base of 25 or 30 of those. Packaging that together with all of the video-based material that is available so that what you have is a coherent classroom going for an ECE level at a home whereby multi-age groups can be benefiting from it. Um, so that's the notion which we are developing and that's a notion that we will inshallah see ourselves taking on television or national television hopefully in the next 10-12 days. Um, so that's been the first base of our response. The second base that we are working on, a second thought process that we're working on with some of the colleagues referred to, um, is the fact that kids are stuck at home. Now, with no technology access, what can some old-fashioned media do? And by old-fashioned, what I'm referring to is the press. Because in the lockdown, the only press facility that we know is working is the newspapers. What kind of interesting learning material, again, multi-age and multi-grade can be evolved, which through essential services such as pharmacies and groceries can actually reach those neighborhoods? One of the other big assets that an organization like TCF has is 15,000 odd alumni within those communities and 10,000 odd local teachers. How can that local asset base combine with the knowledge base that we have in our design teams so that some kind of learning material, um, which a student can do himself or herself with some very little parental support so that the process of learning engagement can continue. So that's, those are the two big things that we are thinking of. How do we respond to this evolving television-based learning and how do you bring in interesting early childhood focused multi-grade teaching and in parallel how do you put together study packs or more more than study packs really self-learning guides so to speak which are uh, which engage the children which entertain the children alongside learning so that their learning momentum and the energy around learning can continue so uh, and this is a question both for our, our friends from tcf and and uh, for paul from rising academies is what is this like for teachers? Meaning that are they, is it more work? Is it less work? You know, there's no concept of, of uh, is, there, is there a concept of homework grading and so on? So what, what does this feel like if you're a teacher? Um, so Paul, if you want, I can address that first. I think from the perspective we are looking at it, I don't see an, a teacher role right now for the next three, four weeks until we end lockdown. Because de facto, the situation is that kids can't go outside of the homes and neither can the teachers. And there isn't a distribution logistical base in the community because of social distancing and because of a de facto curfew kind of situation with very mandated hours. Um, there isn't a role for teachers right now. There might be in a stage two when the lockdown relaxes and there's some community mobility. But right now, I think the role will be with those infrastructure pieces that are happening in the communities and with those alumni and teachers who um, are embedded and therefore can help those who are in their households and perhaps in the adjacent household. Um, that kind of volunteer mobilization, which is very, very ground up. Paul? Yeah, I mean, I would add to that that um, I, I think you have to assume that there is no formal role for the teachers in this um, because of these issues of lockdowns. That said, I think one huge positive of these um, initiatives is that they are a way to role model what engaging teaching looks like in a way that we hope will be helpful for the professional development of teachers in general who are listening. And it may also be that there are some specific opportunities that we can build in to actually create content explicitly directed at um, teachers, because whilst they're out of school, this is a you know, fantastic opportunity for us to be investing in, in teachers' professional development. Great. Um, so then a question for you, which is, you know, the nature of this crisis has been such that 
uh, everyone has had to figure stuff out, right, on the fly. There has, there's, there's been no template, really. Where do you see this going? Now, are there best practices that can come out top down? You know, and top down is not, not a phrase I really like necessarily, but from a policy point of view, saying if something approaching this happens again, here is a protocol, here are best practices in terms of, of uh, content and so on and so forth. Here's what students do, here's what parents do, and so on. Where do you see this going in terms of, you know, is, is there a framework that can come out of it so that the next time something disruptive happens, we can immediately switch to distance learning? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, um, yes. Shashi. I think that, um, you know, there perhaps wasn't sufficient rigorous evaluation during the Ebola outbreak um, and other sort of previous crises to give us really good data on what kind of distance learning works. That's not to say there isn't any, there just isn't a, a great deal. And so to beyond learning itself, there isn't also a great deal of information about these questions around when to close schools, how to keep kids safe out of school. Um, I mean, I, I will say in the research world now, there's obviously a flurry of activity. And I hope that means that we will have more evidence coming um, out of this pandemic than we did going into it. And I hope that we'll also have evidence kind of along the way as well. So, you know, we at CGD are encouraging researchers to be so transparent with their questionnaires and with their data and to openly publish them so that people, governments, policymakers, practitioners like TCF and Rising Academies can, um, can all learn along the way because this may well last for, for some time. Um, I think sort of finally, you know, there's been a huge flurry of blog posts and evidence briefs and lessons learned published since this crisis began. Um, we're guilty of quite a bit of that at CGD and I'm certainly feeling slightly overwhelmed by it right now. Um, but there is, there is a fair bit of evidence out there and we're trying to sort of collate things on the CGD website that can be helpful for practitioners. Um, I think I would just sort of close by saying, you know, I, I think it's fantastic that organisations like Rising Academies, for example, are always willing to submit themselves to rigorous evaluation. I think that organisations who do that really produce kind of these incredibly helpful public goods that others can use sort of both in the immediate term and, and in the future. And I would encourage other organisations to have that courage and have that sort of um, open worldview to, to do the same. Uh, we have another question yes. from the from from the chat. Um, this one comes from from Cheetahs from Star Academy in Zimbabwe, who really likes the idea of distributing content through radio and television and HMS. But the question is to Paul about how to ensure that there's two way feedback between teachers and students and what mechanisms can be used to track students progress and enhance their learning during this period of, of, of remote uh, education? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think part of what we're seeing the role of radio being is to create a kind of infrastructure around which individual schools, individual school networks can then build additional services on top. So one of the ideas that we're playing with for our own schools, which is not necessarily something that we can try and scale nationwide, but which I'd encourage um, uh, uh, the colleague in Zimbabwe there to, to think about is essentially setting up kind of phone-based tutorial groups. So teachers phoning um, up small groups of uh, children, perhaps after a piece of content has just gone out on a radio to have a discussion about what they've just listened to and kind of try and embed the learning that way. Now, that won't be appropriate in all circumstances. That's a theme that we've come back to again and again today. But I think there are opportunities for teachers still to maintain that connection with their students. It's just helpful if they're not having to do, as it were, all of the heavy lifting of instruction and that there is some other way to get that content out, whether it's through the radio, as we're looking at, or TV, as colleagues in TC, from TCF are looking at. Um, let's, let's turn to Mushtaq Bhai. You, you, um, you know, TCF has issued a call to action and a statement. Is something you'd like to share? Okay. Uh, as I had earlier mentioned, that uh, we have uh, created a $3 million relief uh, appeal uh, to our uh, donors and diasporas to uh, address this crisis. The address crisis 
of uh, the communities, uh, especially where CF has uh, a role to play. You see, uh, uh, we have the children who are st studying in our schools and the parents and a, a large number of communities who are, uh, you know, part of the TCF family. So what we essentially will be doing is that uh, we will be planning a relief package. Uh, it's a, it will be a cash relief package. We didn't want to give them uh, food rations because to bring, uh, you know, distribution is an issue in lockdowns. And more importantly, if you give them the liberty of having the money and spending on what they want in, in, the, in the type of food they want. Plus, you see, you're giving an opportunity to the local uh, uh, shop owner also to, to carry on his, li his uh, livelihood. You know, you're, 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 you're building up that kind of a, a sort of a confidence to the local shopkeeper. So this would, this would be a major uh, uh, financing uh, on depending on how long this uh, lockdown lasts. But point is that every two weeks we have planned out a rollout to the families. Then we have got uh, a, a package for our uh, health workers, the professional as well as the volunteers, and to give them, uh, uh, you know, protect, because there could be a, a major catastrophe in terms of, you know, helping people, uh, maybe setting up isolation center or transferring uh, patients uh, for testing and stuff like that. So we've got this, uh, like Reyes mentioned, more than 15,000 uh, alumni who is in, in these communities and who are educated and who are, who are trained to do uh, volunteer work. And lastly, what we, we intend doing is that uh, we will ensure the continuity, ensure the continuity of learning of our kids, you know. And uh, this is where uh, we, are, we are hearing interesting propositions from Paul and Suzanne, Susanna. And uh, we are ourselves, you know, Riyaz mentioned certain initiatives, which inshallah will be rolled out in the next uh, few uh, days, where we will be uh, sort of partnering with the government, the TV channel, and, and maybe making those uh, uh, packs for the children, uh, school kids to be taken to their homes. But this has to be seen, you know, the how this crisis is a, a new thing for us. But this, this, the major $3 million package, which will be uh, sort of uh, given to, uh, 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 we'll be floated this to the diaspora and the, we have appealed to our donors to come up with, with this uh, funding. Great. Uh, uh, let me turn to Riaz and, and, and Paul, you also feel free to jump in. Um, uh, because TCF, as, as Mushtaq was saying, has such a big alumni network that's, that's very closely embedded in the community, how are you seeing the alumni and students engage with the community for things not necessarily related to education? Uh, that's a very good question, Shashi, because I think Paul started off by saying it's health first and then talk about schooling. Yeah. I think there's a link in between, which is food. So as we have reached out to our alumni, particularly uh, in the urban centers, um, a very large population are involved in the informal economy and are daily wage earners. And one of the key crises that is developing right now is a crisis of food provision. Um, as Mr. Saks have alluded to, when it comes to ration packs, when those get across in the community for those to get to the most deserving is a real challenge. And that's where we see our alumni really taking a very strong ownership of the communities where they belong. And that's the dividend of good schooling. That's the division of really taking them through that process because as we speak, we are working on two different communities. Well, one where mobile banking is available, the other where it's not. And both at around midnight, we will have the processes in place for uh, things starting in terms of a community of 500 where you would have Russians being delivered through a partner because there's no mobile banking available there. And another community, which is about 400, 450 beneficiaries who would be having cash transfers done through mobile banking. Entirely volunteer-led initiatives because they are embedded in the community. They are able to go out and find out those daily wage earners, those who make their living from the sea, um, so that those benefits can come to them. So I think that's one of the big responses that we're seeing are young men and women who own the community who are stepping up to the plate and helping those people in need. Great. And, uh, and um, uh, Paul, I'll talk this, toss this over to you. Are there, you know, it's kind of inspiring what Riaz is saying about how the students are taking ownership. 
Is there a lesson here in terms of values? You know, is, is this an opportunity to engage students and say, look, you, you, rather than just being recipients of knowledge and instruction, here are things you can do. Here's how you can take responsibility for your own communities. Absolutely. I, I'd say two things on that. One is that we saw during Ebola that students were really important channels of information to their own families. Like particularly in places where these are essentially first generation learners, they can really help educate their parents. I remember very vividly um, a parent enthusiastically coming up to us and saying how much she'd really appreciated, this was several months into the Ebola crisis, a kind of week's worth of intensive Ebola um, sensitization that we'd done. And I was really excited about that. And then I asked my team, you know, what does, that, what does that woman do for a living? And it turned out she was a nurse at the government hospital. But even for relatively educated um, parents, this can be a really powerful um, additional channel. So I think there's definitely that role. The second thing I'd say, which is perhaps less for the students than, than for the wider kind of um, international community and governments, is we talk a lot about the comparison between this crisis and the Second World War. And in the Second World War, we talked a lot about the greatest generation. From my point of view, these children are the greatest generation of this crisis. They're being asked to sacrifice for their parents and for their grandparents. And we all need to remember that when this thing is done, because we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, is there, and this is, this is to anybody on, on the panel, is there a set of content-ish type of resources emerging as a consequence of this where you know, packages, now independent of whether there's a crisis or not, uh, you know, obviously with, with Khan Academy and so we saw the first generation of, of content, but are you seeing the emergence of an organized body of, of uh, in the material, whether, whether, it's, whether it's on radio, whether, it, whether it's on TV, whether it's internet based? What are you seeing emerging as a result of this? And this is to anybody on the panel. I'm happy to, to start. Um, I, think, I think the huge problem is curation. So, and sort of quality control. Yeah. There is now an absolutely enormous amount out there, but we found during Ebola and we're finding, I think again today, that it's almost sort of overwhelming because um, there is a lot of kind of good stuff and there's a lot of really terrible stuff. And for an individual organization, sort of separating the wheat from the chaff is really, really challenging, especially at high speed. So I think one of the things to figure out for the sort of broader open educational resources movement, which has come on leaps and bounds over the last few years, is just what that curation and kind of quality control looks like um, going forward. Riaz, anything to add to that? I think I would firstly echo what Paul said around curation. I think that's an absolutely key challenge given the variety of content that's out there. But in this early time, I'm seeing a couple of very positive things happening. Firstly, the so to speak, self-imposed silos that would exist between providers, the context has suddenly necessitated the fact that those have fallen away and people are coming together. And I think that's brilliant. Uh, the second thing is that even for people like ourselves, uh, we've always thought of curation as something that we must focus on, but never with this kind of concerted energy. And I think circumstances push you to really think about, you uh, distill the content and you create and you cu curate as per the need of those particular constituencies that you're dealing with. So I think, what I'm seeing here as a um, positive outcome of this is greater consolidation of content at a country level and perhaps globally as well, and curation through those who actually understand schooling systems working very closely with their tech providers by the necessity of the circumstance. So by the end of this, there should be some good curation that would have happened. You know, uh, I imagine a lot of the, the a lot of the colleagues joining in, um, some of them are running individual schools, small school systems which may or may not have uh, either the, the resources and the network that TCF has or the experience uh, that Paul's organization has, right? Are there any, any resources or suggestions you have for the educators and for those uh, on, the, on the call who are in the education business? And Shashi, I'll just add to that because it's, that tracks to a theme that we're seeing on the, on the chat questions. Um, if you guys, in, in the context of answering that question, can speak to extremely low resource settings. So we had a question from Simon, who's working with children with disabilities in refugee camps in Kenya. And he was asking that due to the COVID-19 outbreak, all of the students are doing their best to stay isolated in their, in their homes or their, in, in their communities. Are there any strategies 
that, that he can pursue um, to deliver education remotely during this humanitarian crisis. Was good. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sure. I mean, um, the 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 whole point of what we're trying to do through Rising on Air is is I guess to try and get that content to as many people who can use it. So anyone who's listening who is interested in taking scripts that are in, currently in English medium but could obviously be translated if people want, um, then they should just head to our website, risingacademy.com forward slash on air. And then we're putting everything that we can on there. Not everything is there yet, but we're going to be adding stuff every week for different um, age groups, different um, uh, subjects. And I'd encourage um, anyone who's listening to, to go over there and see what they can do. And it may be that, for example, in the refugee camp setting, there is a, a local radio station um, serving those um, camps. Maybe they can send these scripts over to the station uh, get the people working there to, to add them to, to their broadcasting. It's really just about getting, you know, good content into the hands of anyone who can, who can get it out there to as many children as possible from our point of view. Riaz, you'd mentioned that, uh, uh, that uh, a lot of the ed tech providers and content providers in Pakistan are coming together to make their resources available. Uh, is there anything that's coming out of that that can be useful for educators and organizations outside of Pakistan? Uh, I would imagine so. I think there's some good content that um, could be dubbed or could be used elsewhere as well. And as I said, these are early days, but that things develop. Um, those are things that could be used around the world as well. But to go back to the question that Tim asked earlier, um, I think in the midst of all of this complexity, this very rapidly evolving uncertain times, our thinkings can be muddled. And in the midst of this, uh, without you know, any particular advice, but what I would point out is focus on the basics. And to our mind, there are two very important basics of learning, assuming that learning only happens when a child exercises his or own, own agency. It's a process that is drawn inward um, from inside out rather than outside in. And if you really focus on the child's agency, what would from a child to learn? We believe two things, either content or engagement that is interesting for the child or which builds on existing relationships. So focus on generating interest and focus on relationships. I've already spoken of interest, but one small example of relationships is we run a grade 11, 12 college here in Karachi, which has students, about 425 of them from urban slums all around the city, you know, from two to two and a half hours away. Now, these kids have very patchy mobile phone access. You know, somebody, a father or only a father perhaps will have some kind of smartphone access as part of his or her livelihood. Um, the team on the ground, because there are existing faculty advisors and teacher student relationships, has really evolved a reasonably complex web of connections through Facebook Messenger, through WhatsApp, through SMSing, through personal calling, through two kids collecting in, a, in, in someone's house and evolving a piece whereby learning can continue. Now, that's a very ground up way of doing it. And the key lever that it capitalizes on is relationships with the child. So focus on things that generate interest and focus on things which build on existing relationships. Now, is there, you know, it, everyone's had to learn on the fly, right? Is there anything you wish you could do over? And, and this, is, this is to the, you know, this is to Paul and, uh, and our TCF colleagues, but also to Susanna in terms of, you know, what are you hearing in terms of, uh, even at the policy level, uh, if we had to do this over again, uh, what would we do differently? So we can just go around and, and start with Paul, you know, what, what, what do you wish you could have done differently? Uh, I think it's a bit early to say, honestly. Um, uh, I think, uh, as Susanna said, evaluation is going to be a really key part of this. We're, we're hoping to try and evaluate what we're doing, um, uh, particularly on the SMS side, because it lends itself a little bit more easily to kind of rigorous evaluation precisely so that we can kind of figure out some of those um, lessons. I think the broader lessons that I would draw from Ebola are essentially, you know, basically to echo Riaz, move as quick as you can with the best content that you can. As quick as you can, because the longer the gap between schools closing and kids getting something to engage them, the bigger the risk that they drop out. But make the content as good as you can, because if it's boring or poor quality, you're not gonna sustain that engagement, particularly over several months. And from my point of view, one of the challenges here is to make sure that we get to a point for next time where we can be moving as quickly as possible 
to the best available resources rather than every organization feeling like it needs to kind of invent this thing from scratch. And um, because there is good stuff out there, we just need to be able to locate it better. Uh, Mushtaq and Riaz, anything you wish you could have uh, uh, done differently? Yes. Um, so uh, I think one thought, because in hindsight, hindsight is 2020, but one of the things is that as a formal school system, our view has been in hindsight very um, focused on what happens at school. And I think a crisis like this is, is forcing us to rethink that, to rethink the home space also as a possible opportunity where learning can happen. So um, in hindsight, yes, perhaps a greater focus could have been placed on how do we generate content at home? How do we generate a rhythm at home that learning can continue? But I think looking at the positive, this kind of circumstance perhaps sharpens your instincts and improves you as an organization to say, this is the learning that you can then take inshallah to a phase when we are back to normal, but then home and home-based learning is a real factor rather than just a nice to have. Mushtaq, you were saying something? No, I, I just I just uh, want to reiterate what uh, Riaz is saying, that uh, this is precipitated, you know, maybe we were slow in taking up on the, but if you look back on uh, uh, that uh, this crisis has sort of made us realize, uh, you know, make it more serious uh, that uh, home-based learning or maybe a different type of learning, not classroom alone, is the answer to, to today's problems. Hey, Tim, a quick time check. Uh, um, do we have uh, any suggestions on, uh, do, do you want to add in a, an audience question or shall we do a quick yeah. wrap -up? Here's my suggestion. We still have uh, 265 folks listening and, and several questions yep. uh, still floating out on the, on the chat. My proposal would be that folks who've joined and need to move on to other things, we want to thank you for joining this discussion. Um, we will do our best to continue to answer questions and, and share out to all those who have registered um, responses and resources coming out of this. However, if the panelists and Shashi are available to stay for maybe 10 to 15 more minutes, we could um, bring some more questions and themes that have come up on the chat uh, to answer some of those pressing and burning questions. Great. So let's do the following before people start dropping off. I'd like to ask each panelist to just a very brief, what can you inspire us with something? Say something that gives everybody hope, at least in the education space. And then uh, after that, we can do more q and Mushtaq, you can go first. Okay. Uh, well, um, I think there's a, a great hope in, uh, in, in, in educating people you know, educating boys and girls, you know. These 25 years, you know, I wish I had started earlier. I wish I had uh, uh, made these schools earlier. But, uh, you know, today, uh, uh, it's, it's so gratifying to see that uh, uh, so many schools uh, all over the country, I wish we had the resources to replicate this system in other parts of the world. I know there are a lot of people doing good work. Uh, Paul is one of them. But major, majorly, I wish that we could, uh, you know, bring the schooling schooling system to so that no no child in the world is uh, deprived of quality education. Susanna, over to you. Um, yeah, I mean, asking someone British to be inspirational is kind of the most awkward thing <laughs> you can possibly do. Um, you know, I guess I guess one thing I have been encouraged by is you know, the real concerted effort by so many people all around the world to do something to support education at this time, whether it's to, to the tech companies who are offering content for free or the donors that are, you know, making new commitments or the organizations like TCF and Rising that are sort of really reacting to things on the ground and, and changing their business as usual. I think that's, that's pretty inspiring. Um, I guess, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to sort of pivot slightly, but your question earlier about what could be done differently I think I did just want to make the point that this is a truly global crisis like almost no other. Um, and I do think there's a risk that because it's such a global crisis, we're imposing global solutions on countries where they may not be the right ones. And there was a really good op-ed um, in a Bangladeshi newspaper by my friend and colleague Esther Salo, who's the chief executive of Brack in Bangladesh, talking about 
this is now really a hunger crisis in Bangladesh. The, this lockdown has caused a hunger crisis. Um, and so sort of both in education systems and more broadly, I think sort of careful thought needs to be given to the globalness and the localness of, of this crisis and how, and how we respond to it. Um, I realize that's not inspiring, but I do think it's something that a lot of smart people are thinking about and maybe need to, we need to start moving slightly more quickly on. Paul? Well, um, well, as a parent of young children, I think I speak for parents across the world in saying that there's absolutely no chance that the status of teachers as professionals isn't gonna increase as a result of this crisis because everybody has a newfound gratitude for what they uh, put up with. I think there will definitely be um, innovation that comes out of this. Um, you know, I don't think that we will all suddenly be abandoning schools and classrooms, but I hope that some of the challenges in integrating ed tech with regular schooling, in integrating, as Riaz was saying, what happens in the home with what happens in the school, I think this will force us to break some of those barriers down. But the thing I would say above all is a sense of solidarity. I think that after Ebola, one of the problems was it felt like it had happened a very long way away and to a set of people that were very different from the rest of us in other parts of the world. Literally every kid in the world virtually is out of school because of this. And that is gonna put a, um, the question of education and the obligations that we owe as a world to these children who sacrificed, I think front and center of the coronavirus recovery. And I hope that that means not just more investment in education, which remains criminally underinvested in, but a willingness on the part of governments and international organizations to be brave and bold and in reforming education systems to give those children the education they deserve. Great, Riaz, uh, and the bar is very high. You have to, you have to now, now really inspire us. So uh, just like then I can't do inspiration, but I think Paul has articulated um, what we see evolving from this as positives very well. I think I'll simply end on saying what leaf structure that we come from uh, when we look at this. And I think the first base is the divine guarantee that after hardship comes ease. And that's a very clear conviction in our hearts that if after hardship, there will be ease. And that no matter what happens, there is goodness in that. Um, so we work with that conviction that that goodness will emerge. It's not a question of if it will emerge, it's a question of when it will emerge. So it's almost a state of being curious to see what surfaces. Inshallah. Um, so good, now, now let's switch gears to the after party. Um, so Tim, uh, do you have questions from, from our friends? I do, but for, before I do, as folks may start dropping off to go to, other, to attend other meetings or sessions, I just wanna say thank you to all of you. Uh, to Shashi for moderating such a wonderful panel, uh, for, for Musak and, and Riaz for bringing the situation of, in Pakistan to light and for all the work you're doing um, to pivot your model in a way that can be supportive during this crisis, given the, the, the size of your network in supporting government in all aspects. Thank you for what you're doing and sharing that with us. Paul, we're inspired by what you're continuing to do and thinking through strategies related to remote and distance learning. So thank you for sharing that with us. And Susanna, for bringing in just the, the broader um, context and, and some of the, what the research is saying at the moment. Thanks for bringing that to, to our attention as well. And I'll say as a, as a father of a three-year-old, as soon as the schools are open, I will be giving, <laughs> and it's safe to do so, hugs to those teachers who have been helping uh, to educate my son because I can tell you that I have a renewed appreciation for the profession of teaching, uh, even just after these two or three weeks of, of, of working with my son on a daily basis. So w thank you to everyone who's joined um, from around the world. I've been tracking some of the, some of the questions and just introductions on the Q&A. We've had people from um, all over Africa, places in Europe, including Italy, that's suffering perhaps the greatest from the crisis at the moment, from India, from Kenya, from Zimbabwe, from Ireland, from Pakistan, from Botswana. So thank you to everyone who's joined. One of the themes that was coming up through the, through the questions was around um, social and emotional learning during this period of time. Uh, Kahija from the UK asked specifically, how are you coping with social and emotional learning and safeguarding of children at this moment? Then maybe I'll open that to Susanna first, if there's anything that's been con a consistent theme globally, and then perhaps 
Paul Riaz and Mukha can can share how that's working in their specific organizations. I guess um, the, there's a literature on social emotional learning, which um, I'm happy to to point the the person who asked the question to you on on the chat. I guess in terms of child safety and so on, I have been quite encouraged that this is something that I see a great many organisations being deeply concerned about during this crisis. Um, so in many of my conversations with both the folks on this panel and, and others, um, it's sort of a first order concern for them as schools close down as to how to keep kids um, safe in, in every, every aspect of that word, word in terms of sort of um, enough food and safe from violence and, and another, another risk to them. And there's a, a small bit of a sort of a good literature on, on that and a study that many of us refer to quite frequently is one um, by Oriana Bandiera et al that took place during the Ebola epidemic in, in Sierra Leone uh, four years ago. Um, and that gives some, some great insights, I think, into some of the, the strategies that can be used in this case by organizations like BRAC um, to keep girls safe in a time like this. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, these are uncharted territory for us right now, um, because the core footprint is um, is the community itself and the school itself. Uh, where we are at is right now is a complete lockdown, so kids are at home. Um, now, if there are threats to a child at home, of course, that's something that is a concern. But right now, we are not really seeing, in terms of that horizon, child safety issues emerging very strongly within the TCF network. I think as time goes by and the lockdown eases out, those are questions that will definitely come into play. Great. Paul? Yeah, I think um, it's absolutely the right question to be asking. And as Susanna said, it's certainly one that we and many other organizations I speak to are putting front of mind. I think there's, there's two parts to it. There's the sort of prevention part, what we can do whilst this crisis is going on. Um, to which I think the best answer is to make it part of the content that we're providing, to not see it as separate from COVID-19 messages or the, you know, the, the kind of more academic content that we're providing, but to be through the radio work, through SMS, trying to engage both children and their parents in uh, these issues of, of safeguarding. That said, I think that we also need to be getting ready for, as part of the recovery, a very significant increase in trauma. Um, we know already from data coming out of OECD countries that we've seen a huge increase in domestic violence as a part of um, this issue. I would expect exactly the same to be true in many other countries. And that means that when our children are back kind of more directly under our care, I think we need to be ready for them to need a lot more um, in terms of um, psychosocial support and other services than perhaps they did uh, three or four months ago. Ushtak, anything to add to that? No, I, I don't have anything to add to that. Riaz and uh, Paul and Susanna have spoken about this quite well. So I, I don't think that there's any more for me to say on this uh, topic. Uh, Tim, any, uh, any more questions? If not, I'll jump in with one. Yeah, there's, well, there's one other theme that's kind of, we're seeing a lot of, and I think it's best articulated from a, a TCF volunteer in Lahore who asked the question of when, it just it just moved on me. Um, who said they asked what will be the impact for students who have missed crucial examination periods during um, during this these shutdowns, and how will will schools have to uh, support those kids during that important time who may who that where that may limit their opportunities going forward. Um. So would you like me to address that? Go for it. Sure. So um, I think uh, that's a very good question. And in terms of assessments going forward, there are two facets to it. One is the public sector examinations, which are mandatory. And other is the school level assessment structures that are in play. Now, um, the school level assessment structures go from K to eight. And there we've taken a very clear view is that uh, we should not pressurize our children on that. So we've been thinking about how do we redesign our calendars in preparation for academic year beginning 1st of June, which we are sincerely hoping should be uh, put into play. But when kids come back to 1st of June, we intend to not take exams. We need to uh, be planning to have no assessments and promote children to the next grade 
whilst focusing on remedial learning because use that time to the best of our ability to remediate whatever uh, struggles a child may have with certain concepts so that they are prepared for the next grade. So focus rather than on assessments of learning, focus on remedial programs which can help a child prosper. When it comes to the public sector examinations, I think there uh, some of those examinations would be necessary. As you know, Cambridge has taken a slightly different view on predictive grades and schoolwork. Um, the boards in Pakistan currently have a line where they are saying that examinations will happen in June. But um, that's something that various people, including ourselves, are parts of those conversations. And that may also turn out to be slightly different reality, but too early to call. Great. So Tim, uh, wh why don't we give, uh, do one more question from the audience and then I have one last question to add. That's perfect. And the last question is around the health impact that, that may be coming from this. So the question is, what are the evolving objectives of primary education in regards to health during this emergency? And are there any indications on how this could impact um, student retention and attendance um, going forward? Who wants to take that? Riaz, you should. I can, yep. I can speak to it. So I think that's the thing that we are concerned about. So firstly is the health impact. And I think this will accentuate the need for embedding health and hygiene within, uh, within the core curriculum. And that's something we've very strongly focused on at TCF and we're seeing the dividends of that in terms of our students and our alumni on the ground. But I think the big concern is what happens from here on because livelihoods have suffered, economies have suffered. I think for things to get back to normal in terms of economies will take a longer time. And that's where when a household is compromised, even if the school is almost free, to what consistency will the child come? Will the child be, will be able to retain the child at school because there will be livelihood earning pressures on the child as well, particularly when you come to middle and secondary schools. I think that's where as schools open, um, one of the huge tasks for our teachers who are embedded in the community will be to work child by child, household by household to ensure that we are doing our very best to retain the child in school. Great. Uh, I'll ask a last question then. Uh, actually, Paul, anything to add to that? Okay. Great. Uh, so what are the, you know, let's start with, with uh, Susanna, as you are collating, you know, a global, uh, global sort of knowledge and, and learnings, what are the next few weeks looking like for you? And I'll ask that same question for the next few weeks to everybody. Um, so over the next few weeks, we are going to continue tracking what countries are doing to respond to the crisis. We are planning to collaborate with a bunch of different organizations to um, run household surveys in multiple countries to understand more about the effects of this crisis on um, sort of the income and the livelihoods and ultimately the educational decisions of, of families in, in developing countries. Um, and we hope that will be sort of useful information both in the short term to enable um, governments potentially to respond to sort of mitigate those shocks that families are facing as well as in the long term in terms of thinking about sort of how to um, implement better social protection measures in the future. Um, we are working on sort of a bunch of policy briefs that we hope will be helpful for governments who are making decisions at the moment and we are hoping to get off the ground a couple of randomized control trials to do sort of really good rigorous evaluation of some of these programs that will kind of be then the gold standard for, for sort of future crises like this. Great. Riaz, what are the next week, few weeks looking like for you? Uh, so, um, I think interesting. It's the first thing. Uh, these are uncertain times, but what one would hope is that by the end of April, we should have provided uh, food support to 10 to 20,000 yeah. families across the TCF network with the help of our alumni. Uh, we would hope to be uh, running a reasonably robust television education structure, uh, supporting the government on that. So that finding shape and form in some kind of feedback loops kicking in. Uh, the whole intention of putting in some self-study materials in the, in the hands of children and that being operationalized, we hope to see that in play by the end of April. Um, and with that, whatever uh, support we can provide to frontline healthcare and workers um, in terms of personal, personal equipment, that should come into play. Great. Paul. Yeah, so for us, the next few weeks, I think promises to be just as hectic as the last few. So the big priorities for us are firstly, getting as much of our content as we can up onto our website at risingacademies.com forward slash on air. 
Um, the second is to build partnerships with organizations who want to use that content. Um, we're already implementing it in Sierra Leone and Liberia. There are conversations going on um, with uh, implementing partners in Zambia and the Gambia. But there's lots of other live conversations as well from uh, partners in other countries. Maybe if there are people out there listening today um, who are interested, um, that can lead to, to even more of those discussions. The final thing is to echo what Susanna said. We want to be learning as much as we can as we start getting this stuff uh, actually being implemented. So getting a rigorous evaluation going and just building our own internal systems so that the next time this happens, and as we said, it probably will, we're in a better place as an organization to figure out what to do about it. Great. Uh, Mushtaq Bhai, and in, in, uh, you in particular, since you also work on health, what are the next Well, uh, my, my job, uh, firstly, is to see that uh, all the grand uh, ideas and plans which TCF, uh, my colleagues Riaz and the others have put up, I need to see to it that the funding is in place. You know? uh, we will be needing a lot of resources, human resources, volunteers, but most of all, we'll be needing the support of uh, the donors, of the supporters all over the world who have always been there in times of need. Uh, so my, my job in the coming weeks is totally focused, you know, we've been having uh, uh, on, 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 on almost daily basis, we've been having uh, Zoom uh, calls and, uh, you know, uh, uh, conferences and uh, rolling out this plan and explaining to them how uh, we would be helping the communities in times of distress. And I'm, I must tell you that I've been receiving a very, very positive uh, response from all over the world where the, the, the we have more than 10,000 uh, volunteers, supporters all over the world uh, in, in nine, ten different countries. Uh, on, and the, on, the, on the second year, as you, as you hinted, that I'm also working on the health side. And uh, I'm part of the task force of the government of Sindh uh, in Pakistan, which is uh, uh, dealing with uh, the, the isolation centers and the critical care for the COVID-19 uh, uh, patients, you know. We are, we are fortunate that the numbers are not uh, as high as uh, in other parts of the world. And we are praying that they remain within because the healthcare system is not the best uh, uh, in, in, in Pakistan. And, but in any case, uh, uh, I'm working on both the fronts and I'm praying, uh, keeping my fingers crossed that you know, things don't get out of hands. Great. Well... Thank you all for the work you do, uh, Tim. Thank you, and to the Skoll Foundation for all the support you guys provide and the forum you guys provide, and also to all the participants. Everyone, everyone's putting their shoulder to this wheel. So let's hope we get through this and then stay strong, stay healthy. Great. Bye bye. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Just a, in, as a closing, we'll send a message to all the 300 plus uh, attendees with links to the individual organizations discussed today. I just want to join Shashi in saying thank you, everyone, for such, a, such an engaging discussion. I know personally I'll, I want to watch again just to make sure I can pick up all the nuance and pearls of wisdom that you shared. So thank you very much. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.